Now, the minority in parliament has joined calls for government to sell off properties of gold dealership firm Men's Gold to pay some customers whose funds are locked up. It comes as the Kumasi Circuit Court has ordered the auction of properties belonging to the company to pay off some of their aggrieved customers. Customers of the gold dealership firm uh, besieged the locked up offices of the company yesterday at Jolu, demanding the arrest of uh, Chief Executive Officer of the company, Nana Apia Mensa. Many of them say they have become impoverished as a result of the shutdown of the company's operations, and they want government to intervene. Uh, here is Secretary of the Aggrieved Men's Gold Customers, Samuel Odati. Yes, I blame government. Because if it is a, a legal business they are, or illegal business you, you, you so-call, that they don't have license, what are the billboards doing in, in, in the town? Oh, uh, what are the radio adverts doing? At this time, it, if it is were to be Europe or somewhere, they have resigned. In the UK, a minister resigned because of one pound. What is happening in Africa and Ghana? The state institutions are failing us. If the person is not doing the right business, why did you give him the license? This kind of uh, so-called Ponzi they have been saying happen everywhere in the world. But when it happens, their government makes sure they go after the scammer or the, the, uh, the person who created the, uh, the Ponzi scheme mm -hmm. to come and pay or refine their money to uh, each citizen. Why is it that in Ghana they allow the guy to work about free? When you go there to their office, the police will People probably be allow you to enter the office to make inquiry what is going on. They, the police are guarding the they office. They are guarding the office. Uh, police or security guards? Police. police. State police. Ghana Police Service. When I came in, in 2017, August, you went back and slept for a whole year to pass. And then on, on the 6th of August 2018, you came with another warning again. If you are doing the right thing when you came in 2017 with the warning, what do you have to do? You have to do your underground work. And then give the guy time to pay his, and then close the person. You don't go and sleep, and then wake up one day and come and give another warning, and go back and sleep again. After all, it was the Bank of Ghana who, who, who stopped a, a, a man's good. He wasn't the one. Mm. He was sick. He realized that place wasn't his jurisdiction. So he has to fall on self to come in. So they created a problem. They have to solve the problem. They have to put structures in place. For the guy to pay us, you don't come and create problems and go and relax and say, we the citizens should, should go and fight for our, our, our money. Or oh, you want us. You want us. Well, as we indicated earlier, a Kumasi Circuit Court has ordered that men's gold properties in some parts of that city be auctioned off. My colleague Erastes Asari Donko has been following up on this. He joins us on the telephone. Erastes, uh, first of all, when did the court give this order and which of the company's properties have been attached for auction? Well, so the uh, court gave the order um, yesterday, but the case itself was uh, filed in court by one Henry Dako, uh, who is a plaintiff, um, that was on 3rd December. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Men's Gold was given uh, some days to respond. And I'm told that they filed the response very late. And so uh, Henry Dako, who is a plaintiff, uh, secured a, uh, a, 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 a judgment in, in his favor. And the, the men's school has been given 21 days, starting from 14th December, that if they are not able to pay him his money uh, amounting to 22,500 uh, Ghana cities, then uh, they will have to sell off the company's uh, premises at uh, Amakum and then Patase and other uh, properties that are linked to men's gold to defray uh, this cost. And so that is what happened. I understand that there was another case, somebody else also has taken men's go to the same court, that's the KMA uh, Circuit Court, uh, but the case was called today. The plaintiff uh, or the uh, men's go representative did not show up, and so the, the case was not adhered to. But have you managed to get some word or some form of reaction from officials of men's gold in Kumase, especially after the directive from the court? In fact, I went to the Amakum branch of men's gold, and in fact, the uh, building was locked with a padlock. I understand that a court bailiff came in 
with some uh, metal chains and a padlock and locked it up. And they also placed the order, that's the notice of the court order, on the uh, frontage right. of the building. And so uh, there were no uh, workers at the site when I went in. The same applies to the uh, Patasa branch of Men's Gold. Mm. And so there was nobody to respond to any queries right. from me at all. All right. And so when, when is the auction expected to take place? That is, in the event the company does not find, uh, file an appeal uh, against a directive. And so 21 days, starting from the 14th of December. Mm -hmm. So if you start counting uh, within the next uh, 21 days, okay. uh, if Mengold has not paid Mr. Henry Dacon uh, his 22,500 gamma cities, then definitely uh, the, the court will issue an order mm -hmm. for the said items to be uh, auctioned and then his money uh, given to him. Right. Many thanks. Erastus Asari Donko is with our sister station, Love FM, in Kumasi with that update. Well, speaking of properties, lawyer for one of the customers, Roger Nauf, who invested more than one million CDs in the company, has petitioned the Securities and Exchange Commission on the matter. Amanda Clinton says assets of the company should have been frozen. She's also accusing the company of breaching its investment agreement. That's what I'm saying is the government is in the power to earmark public funds, you know, I mean, public assets in terms of the public invested in this company. Another major issue is the SEC. The SEC has said that there is nothing preventing men's gold from paying customers because all the SEC said is that they can't get new customers, but they didn't prevent them from paying people. Furthermore, we would say that this is a breach of investor agreement and not fraud in terms of it's the government to decide what's happening with this company. We can't do that. But what we can say is that the investor agreements are very generous towards the investor. Um, and they did that so that a lot of investors would come in. And so the investor agreement said, without fail, you will be paid every month, failing which you can just opt to get out of the agreement and forfeit 25 percent you also stated uh, something about the whereabouts of nana piament uh, your no. private investigators have been looking into this as well yes so where is he right now I, I couldn't tell you exactly where he is but i mean i even have friends who were uh, as of a week and a half ago whatsapping him in south africa do you know what i mean so this is from different sources private investigators etc Meanwhile, Men's Gold has petitioned Parliament's uh, Finance Committee to intervene in a standoff with the Securities and Exchange Commission in the petition signed by the company's corporate affairs manager, Nanaya Ofe. The company said the directive by the SEC for it to halt its operations uh, with gold collectibles has posed a lot of challenges for it. It reads, um, as part of our quest to resolve the issue, we would like to propose the following for your kind consideration. One, a comprehensive payment plan to pay off completely all customers who wish uh, to discontinue their trading of gold collectibles. Two, halting of the online migration until the matter is fully resolved and as is directed by the regulators. Three, to withhold gold collectibles include trading operations for three months, organize and restructure corporate operations. Four, to revise the business module and review the percentage offering on our gold collectible trade. And five, to commence full operations as may be directed by the Securities and Exchange Commission at the end of the moratorium period when all has been revised by the Securities and Exchange Commission and advised accordingly. Well, a minority spokesperson on finance and member of the Finance Committee in Parliament, Casey Latuforsen, agrees with calls for the properties of men's gold to be sold off to defray the cost to customers. He tells Joy News Nana Pia Mensa must also be prosecuted. It doesn't matter. A crime is a crime. 
government warned people against rape, yet people raped them. So that is that doesn't matter. But the, what but is the, important? But do not go yes, but but but, but you know, but at the end of the day, government doesn't say that because you have been raped, mm. and I warned you, I will not. I'm not going to uh, prosecute the ra rapist. Mm. Government is running away from their responsibility, and that is a shame. I call on His Excellency the President to use the power vested in him the, by the Constitution of the Republic to ensure that the perpetrators, particularly the owners of men's gold, who have committed such a crime, be brought the book, use the power of the state to ensure that indeed the resources uh, uh, of this crime uh, are located wherever it is and be able to recover for the purposes of... What if it's not easy? enough? What if it's not enough? Is it, and, uh, it, and, and it, 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 you see, assuming somebody has taken 10 million cities of yours and you can recover 9 million, it's better to recover the 9 million than to say that I'm not going to act at all. I think government attitude is nothing but a failure. In government effect, has failed in this matter. In, 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 in effect, you're asking for the prosecution of yes, the in, management in, in, and the in chief effect, executive, right? I am right? asking the government of the Republic of Ghana, the chief executive of the Republic of Ghana, who is the president of the Republic of Ghana, to act. To act. And to prosecute him. You, you've already described it as a crime. Not only prosecution, but to find where these assets are, sell them, prosecute them, and make sure make sure that that asset are recovered in a way that the ordinary Ghanaian can get his money back. Part chairman of the committee, Mark Isibeyabwa, disagrees with calls for government to intervene in the customer's dilemma. He says they were repeatedly cautioned. They, they, they want an intervention by the finance committee. I don't think we have those powers. The finance committee to intervene uh, in a meeting between them and SEC and all that. You know, this has been a busy period, all of December, so we haven't really averted our minds to their request. But we've distributed their petition to all members of the committee, and the generality uh, is a divided committee on this matter, whether to invite them or not. Okay, but then the general thing is about the funds of the ordinary people and how it can be protected, which is raising all the blue the government Is there any intervention that Parliament can bring to bear? Parliament, Parliament, Parliament uh, is that the business we do here? That would be government. Okay, that would be government. Well, you government do you have any recommendations for government on how we should do it? No, no, no. Well, if it's a charge on the national purse, we cannot do that, you know? Yeah. Ashima, would you agree that you know, government should possibly intervene and resolve some of these issues so that then the those government, who are the losing government money won, will... won those who put their money there. The government won them. As as um, as late as February 2017, men's gold came to the finance committee and then we told them what they were doing was illegal. At that point, if anyone wanted to take out their funds, they, could, they would have been able to do so. Okay. So yeah. those crying now, it, it, it's probably their own cousin, and, yeah, and, and they, they shouldn't are, be going back they, to they government. They are crying over now. spilled milk. Yeah. They, 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 and the students have brought this trouble upon themselves, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, people are comparing this one to DKM. DKM was regulated by the central bank. So, uh, in, in a sense, it's like one of the seven banks that have gone underwater. But men's gold was not regulated by SEC, neither was it regulated by the Bank of Ghana. Away from men's gold, the Economic and Organized Crimes Unit, IOKO, has begun investigations into the operations of fund managers, Gold Coast Securities. Gold Coast Securities. Uh, this comes after complaints from clients that they are struggling to retrieve their investments. According to media reports, sources within the organization say some personnel of the securities company have been interrogated. A group calling itself Concerned Gold Coast Fund Management Customers petitioned IOKO and the Securities and Exchange Commission to investigate the company. They are particularly demanding the immediate arrest of key persons in the company, including Dr. Papa Kwesi Indum, the 2016 presidential candidate of the Progressive People's Party and owner of the company. But officials of the company have assured clients that the bank does not intend to abscond with their funds, but was working with them through the challenges to ensure that no client uh, loses. Uh, the company, in an official statement, said all investments of their clients are safe.
You're watching Joy News Prime with me, Arabo Kumsin. Still to come, Electoral Commission announces collaboration with Ghana Police Service to curb any electoral violence that may erupt during Thursday's referendum. And also in business, Aviation and Tourism Ministries to collaborate to increase volume of air passengers next year. Details coming up after the break. You're welcome back. Now, the Electoral Commission has announced its collaboration with the Ghana Police Service to curb any electoral violence that may erupt during Thursday's referendum. Residents in areas earmarked for the creation of the proposed six new regions will participate in the referendum to vote for or against recommendations to increase the number of administrative regions from 10 to 16. The Commission has been outlining its preparedness at a news conference in Accra. My colleague, Quizzy Parker Wilson, has the rest of the story. Over 2 million registered voters are expected to vote at 4,789 polling stations of the proposed areas. The issue for the determination at the referendum, as required by law, is whether the voters support the creation of a particular proposed region or not. Registered voters within regions from which proposed new regions will be carved out after tampering on ballot paper for or against the creation. The associated ballot color for yes is yellow and brown for no. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jin Mengsa, has been highlighting preparations ahead of the referendum. Logistics for the referendum, including materials and items for all activities relating to the referendum, have been procured and dispatched to the affected regions. These include stationery and various election related forms. The biometric verification devices, namely BVDs, to be used for the referendum have all been refurbished. Each polling station will have two BVDs. In addition, a provision has been made for backup BVDs at the regional and district offices of the Commission. All BVDs have been dispatched to the affected regions and districts. She also revealed that Identify flashpoints have been submitted to the security services to put measures in place to ensure smooth referendum. Within the North Gonja districts of the proposed Savannah region, we have Mamprugu and Mankrala communities there. We have also Sankore in the Asuna, four districts of the proposed Ahafo region. And we also have the Dambai Township in the proposed OT region. But we do have a number of flashpoint areas that we've okay, given so mentioning the names. Yes, because I think what happens is we even the initial letter that we wrote to the Ghana Police Service, specifically the Inspector General of Police, we mentioned the number of flashpoints. But as we noted, we have some coordinators, referendum coordinators in the field who are updating us on a weekly basis. So we even currently we are writing to the IGP again with an additional list. So the commission also indicated its readiness to organize a special voting exercise on Monday, 24 December, for special voters comprising security personnel, electoral commission officials, and the media. The about 10,000 voters will be casting their votes at the 48 special voting centers in the district of the carved areas. Chrissy Parker Wilson for Joy News. Now, an Accra High Court has struck out a case filed by former Finance Minister Dr. Kwabna Dufour challenging the takeover of Unibank by the Central Bank. The court on Friday ruled that the case was not appropriately filed. Dr. Dufour and other shareholders of the defunct bank in August 2018 uh, dragged the Bank of Ghana to court demanding the return of the bank, uh, citing breach of their rights. Well, that action has failed. There's more in the following report by Joseph Akable. Lawyers for the Central Bank in September 2018 made an application to the court asking that the case challenging the takeover of Unibank be set aside. 
They argued the shareholders of defunct Unibank had initiated a legal action using the wrong procedure. They insisted that grief shareholders should have resorted to the arbitration rather than issuing a writ. They added that the shareholders could have rather filed for a judicial review if they intended to question the administrative decision of BOG rather than by a writ of summons. Lawyers for the shareholders, however, urged the court to look at the substance of the case rather than the form. They maintained their case was solely about whether BOG was right in revoking Unibank's license, setting up and transfer of its asset to the consolidated bank Ghana. Justice Angelina Mensah Humia in her ruling held that a writ in its present form is a mixture of two procedures which the shareholders should have followed. She said if proceedings are still like the shareholders argue, what then happens to the human rights aspect of the case? The court, she said, is of the opinion that a case filed in its present form could not stand and should be set aside. It is not clear whether the shareholders of the defunct bank may consider appealing the decision of the court. Now, Parliament's Constitution and Legal Affairs Committee is expressing worry about what it says is an ego clash between the Special Prosecutor, Martin Amidu, and Attorney General, Gloria Kufu. Ranking member on the committee, Inu Safusaini, is concerned the situation could impede the fight against corruption, but Deputy Attorney General, Joseph Pemka, is disputing the claim. Parliament Friday approved a budget of 180 million Ghana CDs uh, for the office. South Dai MP Roxton Dafia Mepo also expressed worry some of the budget items in the special prosecutor's uh, budget have not been properly accounted for. In our engagement with the special prosecutor, we saw that there appeared to be a clash of personalities arising out of ego between the special prosecutor and the attorney general's office. Mr. Speaker, we cannot achieve our intended purposes if we work in silence. We cannot, Mr. Speaker. Like Captain Planet, there must be synergy. Indeed, the special prosecutor's office is derived from the attorney general's office, and particularly Parliament has carved out part of the prosecutorial powers of the Attorney General in terms of corruption and corruption-related uh, offenses for a special prosecutor. We only expect that the special prosecutor in the performance of his function will not be influenced, directed, or controlled by the Attorney General's office. But we expect that the Attorney General's office will collaborate with the special prosecutor. It is not the case, and I repeat, it is not the case that there is a clash of egos between the Honorable Attorney General and the... Honorable, it, never, it was never said. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the expenditure and the management and administration, there is, there is an allocation of 20 million cities for other expenses. And the same other expenses, an amount of 10 million cities is located for the operations under anti-corruption management. Mr. Speaker, the Office of the Special Prosecutor was unable to give the expenditure details of, for these allocations. And I, and I thought that it is very interesting because, you see, even the, the Office of the National Security Coordinator brings his budget and tells us how it intends to spend money allocated to it. And I expect the Office of the Special Prosecutor to operate in a very transparent manner because it is an office that we are empowering to go and fight the tanker of corruption in, in respect of other public office holders and other private individuals operating within the jurisdiction. And so we want to urge him that whatever expenditure outlines that are located, we should be able to tell Parliament at least how the office intends to, to expand the expenditure outlines on those ones. The minority in Parliament is also warning Get Fund could collapse soon and worsen infrastructural deficits in schools. The House Friday approved a budget of 1.8 billion CDs for the fund, but member of the Finance Committee, Ben Kodo, says the capping of the fund threatens its sustainability. Yes, the funding of the institution it's problematic. It's problematic because we all decided as a nation that whatever 
uh, we consume and we pay for two and a half percent of uh, the, 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 the tax on it should go to get fund. So give that money to get fund so that they can carry out their activities. But you take part of the money, then you go and ask them to borrow money from uh, uh, investors. And investors don't give money free. You have to pay interest, which is going to in future limit the uh, capacity of get fund to even do more work because they will have to use part of their funds to pay interest. You see, these are our uh, concerns about uh, the management of the funds of get fund. We think that gradually it's being killed. It's being killed. It's being killed as in what? It's being collapsed? Yes, it's yes, because if you are depriving the fund, uh, I mean the institution, the trust fund, of the monies due it, what are you doing to it? So what are you doing? You, you have fears that in future it may not be available yes, to fund infrastructure Yes, because if you see the cash flow projections, taking 1.5 billion, the interest that is going to be paid on it is huge. Yes. How do they rescue it, you say? We think that get funds should not be capped. Its funds should be wholly given to the institution so that with their own management approach, they can uh, carry out their projects, pay their arrears to contractors, execute new projects, and uh, uh, do whatever will be uh, necessary within the sector to enhance education. Now, minority spokesperson on communications, ABA Fusseini, says Ghanaians are experiencing hardship under the current government. President Ikufuadu at the Wednesday media encounter stated that his administration has done far better in putting money in the pockets of Ghanaians than the erstwhile National Democratic Congress government. While speaking on Upfront, ABA Fusseini said the continuous increase in fuel prices uh, have drained the pockets of Ghanaians, leaving many destitute. The president himself has had to accept <laughs> that there's hardship in the system. Yes, but he says that there's more money in the people's pocket now than it was before. That, 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 that is uh, respectfully. The feathers you can go from the tooth. Raymond, just go outside here. When I was coming here, I saw, so I, just as I dropped, there was mm -hmm. an argument between a taxi driver and a, 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 a client. And I was putting his and said that Yes, but this thing I'm paying. I don't have anything again. But the other person, the individual cannot be a replacement. No, I'm society. just giving you a macrocosm. Yeah. I just got here. Okay. Joy FM is a, a reputable thing. Take your, 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 your cameras and go out. Yeah, but you have to give me everything that give you, of living at West of I can give you before. that you may not even reach the next traffic light. And you would have even accomplished the objective of your mission. The number of people who you meet who will complain to you that their pockets are empty. Hmm. Remo, under the ages of this government, Within two years, fuel prices have gone up more than 17 times. Okay? It's this also, it's this, also come down this was a party and... It's, it's, uh, it, let's acknowledge, it's also come down a few occasions. It's just, it's more just, recently, yes, you've seen some yes, changes yes, in there. You can, you, once in a while, you can get some very cosmetic reductions. That's cosmetic. Yes. The rises have been more than the reductions that have come. Just go and do the check. Okay? But, Raymond, I'm saying that this is a government... We are in opposition that had promised the good people of this country that fuel prices at 14 CDs a gallon at that time was way too much and that the government of His Excellency President Mahama was insensitive. Mm -hmm. And that when they come, if the good people of this country and trust the mandate to stay the affairs of this country in President Akufuadu, they will see, they didn't say the only reductions, they will see drastic reductions. Remember, those were their words, drastic reductions. Now you come. Within a space of two years, fuel prices, like I said, goes up 17 times from about 14 CDs a gallon to almost getting to 26 CDs a gallon. Under your watch, where taxi drivers, throttle drivers, other uh, operators of uh, uh, private transport, Remo, who joined you and formed an organization called Drivers for Change. Okay. Today have their businesses ruined. Most of them today are rendered almost destitute. Because their jobs have collapsed. They cannot even buy fuel to operate uh, 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 the transport that they used to get, even under President Mahama, money to put in their pockets. So, Raymond, today, most of their pockets, if they are even still there, 
are ridden are ridden with holes. There's nothing in it, nothing in their pockets, because they have had to take everything out in order to even afford fuel. Now to our editorial. Last Wednesday, President Ikufuado opened up his administration for questioning. Over 100 journalists were present. 70 journalists indicated they had questions. At the end, only 14 journalists got the opportunity. The engagement was supposed to start at 5 p.m. Well, it started 30 minutes late. The president then spent about 40 minutes delivering a statement on his achievements. Well, after 14 male journalists asked questions, the press encounter ended at 7 p.m. Mr. Charles Techibuedu has a question on international relations. Can we stop there? Can we just stop there? That will be the 7 o'clock, especially Charles Techibuedu. He's, he's my good friend. Let's stop with Charles Techibuedu. Please step up to the microphone. Please step up to the microphone. Let's stop with Charles Techibuedu. Well, we did the math and we realized that journalists just got 55 minutes to ask questions. But the 55 minutes also factors in answers from the president and his ministers. We all know the president spent several minutes answering questions. So could we, in all honesty, describe this as a presidential encounter with the press? This encounter has been described as the worst ever in the history of the Fourth Republic by some. Um, for me, I think um, this, I would say, is the worst ever um, presidential media encounter that I've witnessed. Um, since the inception of the Fourth Republic. I think that what really happened, in my view, was literally the president addressing the nation, kind of a, you know, um, as they used to say, a state broadcast. Mm -hmm. And perhaps it was about spicing it up with media people being present in the room and maybe garnishing it with the opportunity mm -hmm. of a few journalists being given the chance to, to ask um, questions. Well, the president and the NPP, who had benefited enormously uh, from the work of civil society organizations when he was leading the NPP in opposition, had a word for them. What about the attacks by the think tanks and the opposition on policies? Is that right? This is what we have all fought for for a long time, an open society that allows everybody to express their views on government policy and uh, develop alternative views, support, as the case may be. But one thing that is becoming clear to me is that it seems that every step that we want to take to modernize our society, to initiate the process of transformation, is met with resistance by our opponents. <clears throat> Well, some civil society groups are not happy and have described his posturing as disrespectful. Now, these are concerns. Why should the president agree to meet up with journalists when he had no time on his hands? We know the president has stated that he is in a hurry. <laughs> Could that be the reasons he abruptly ended his engagement with the media? Only 14 questions were asked. None from female journalists. None. Perhaps governments forgot their commitment to gender balance. I hope you get the point. This is indeed regrettable. In other news, board chairman of the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, Frank Davis, has declared the era of girl boys at the various DVLA offices is over. He says the DVLA has posted the price list of services being offered in order to enhance transparency, accountability and fairness at the offices. Frank Davis, who was speaking at the official opening of the Winchit District DVLA office in the Bonohafu region, emphasized the authorities' plan to block every loophole that are being exploited by middlemen. There's more in Nesta Kafui Ajoma's report. The Bonohafu Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority, located in Suyang, was launched in 1964, followed in 2005 with the Teshiman branch, Gosso in 2011, and Kintampo in 2016. 
the opening of the Wenchi district office makes it a fifth in the region. Board chair of DVLA, Frank Davis, said the authority is continually updating its systems to ward off boys. He added the system is further being structured to make it possible for customers to spend less than an hour at any DVLA office. Chief Executive Officer of DVLA, Kwesia Jibambuzia, said construction of a private vehicle testing station has already begun four miles north of Wenchi. The station, when launched in July next year, will provide that much-needed boost for employment opportunities for the youth. Effective today, when chief vehicle and motorbike riders do not have to drive northwest to Kentampo or head south to Tichinan for any of the services to be rendered. It is my hope that today the seed is being sown, if not nourished, for the driver unions and the MTTD, the DDLA, to collaborate better and deliberate together for the welfare and safety of the people of this town. The launching of this office is a culmination of the tireless efforts and collaboration of five-sidedness of the district assembly and of the open-mindedness of the MCE, Dr. Fie, not to mention the cooperation and the backing of the DVLA Board of Directors and Management. Minister of Transport Kweku Furi Siyama, in a speech read for him, bemoaned the recent disregard for motor traffic regulations by motorcycle riders. He therefore entreated all road users to adhere to road safety regulations and signs to help reduce road crashes. Nesta Kafuya Juma's report for Joy News. Now, the Inspector General of Police, David Asantia Pietu, is warning travellers and the general public to be wary of frosters these holidays. In his Christmas and New Year message, Mr. Asantia Pietu pledged to ensure that officers provide maximum security during the Yuletide, but also cautioned the general public to take their personal security serious. Here are excerpts of the IGP's Christmas and New Year message. Christmas and New Year festivities are major events in our national and international calendar. As Ghanaians, it has always been an annual affair for us to prepare feverishly for Christmas and New Year events. As the Inspector General of Police, I wish to assure all Ghanaians and foreigners living in Ghana that the police administration has put in place pragmatic measures to ensure the safety and security of your homes, communities, business premises, marketplaces, hospitals, churches, beaches, highways, among others. However, it is worth noting that crime prevention all over the world is a shared responsibility. The police can only be successful in this collective effort if the citizenry and non ghanaians visiting or resident in Ghana support the police in crime prevention and detection by providing information to the police. I want to also assure Ghanaians of our commitment to ensure that you go through the Christmas and New Year festivities without any major security challenges. Whilst the police, with support from other security agencies, will put their best feet forward to ensure the safety of every person in the country. Security begins with you as a person, group, neighbor, family, and a good citizen of this country. Therefore, don't take your security for granted. Be alert at all times. Furthermore, always ensure you have our police emergency numbers on hand now, the biggest family outdoor event this Christmas, uh, Joy FM's family party in the park, comes off tomorrow, Saturday, December 22nd, at the Legon Botanical Gardens from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Well, the annual event is organized uh, to help families relax, bond, and enjoy quality time after a year of work and school. We'll hear from the general manager, sales here at the Multimedia Group Limited, David Max Fuga. But first, here are excerpts of last year's event. And all of that, Daddy taught you. Give me five. Yay, all the best, okay? Mommy, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. Great. How is baby boy, too? He's also doing How 
long is he? He's five months. Old. Five months. If you did not come because you have a little boy or girl, well, it's your own fault. So how have you seen it so far? Wow, it's been interesting. It's been fun. See the kids so happy and enjoying themselves. It's been fun. She's overly excited. What's your name? Paris. Paris and Mimi. Mimi, are you siblings? Yeah. No. no. But you're just friends. You met here. Yeah. Are you excited you came? Yes. Okay. What else will you be doing apart from Bouncy Castle? Face painting. Would you be asking mommy and daddy to always bring you to family party in the park? Yes. The cooking competition has just started. We'll come back to find out who the winner is. And this is amongst parents. Parents who brought their children here. It's over and they were all adjudged as winners. How, how was it for you? It was fun. Cooking is fun and cooking is hard. Cooking is an art, and I love cooking. And how about you, mommy? And um, how was how are they feeling for you? It was excited. I I was excited doing it. <laughs> I think this is the first time I've been in a competition like this, and I was enjoying it. It was great. Let's now hear from General Manager Sales for the Multimedia Group Limited, David Maxfuga. I think the crowd tomorrow will be the envy of all political parties. Whoa. Uh, over a thousand tickets have been sold. Amazing. And uh, we have a figure about putting a break on the sale of tickets. Mm. Um, we're setting up the place as I speak to you now. We are demarcating the, the uh, areas, the sports mm. areas, and everything is being sorted out. Security has already been de deployed at the place, and we're going to increase the numbers tomorrow to ensure the safety of life and property. Mm. And the, the surprise includes a lot of giveaways tomorrow. As I speak to you now, somebody just brought us um, what we call popcorn machines to give away. Wow. So we've moved from the TV sets, the refrigerators, the ACs, now we've added popcorn machines. Mm -hmm. And so it's, there's going to be a lot of giveaways for the parents, there's going to be a lot of giveaway for the kids. We're going to have a grotto where Santa will be there to dish out the prizes. I mean, wow. give out a lot of prizes for people. I mean, there's going to be a lot of food and a lot of free things. You know, we mm. want it to be uh, a memorable experience for everybody who walks in there tomorrow. Fantastic. And so the entire family is invited, I mean, to be there and have fun. Like I keep on saying, for a whole year, you've been busy. Just take tomorrow to have fun with the family. Now, Deputy Minister of Health, Kingsley Jedu, says the health minister is working together with the Medical and Dental Council to formulate some policies to discourage doctors who practice outside their scope of knowledge. According to him, this will make practitioners more accountable professionally and help the council regulate the practice of medicine and dentistry. He spoke to join News on the sidelines of the induction of newly qualified medical and dental practitioners in Accra on Friday. The induction ceremony saw some 297 graduates from various medical schools in the country and abroad inducted as medical and dental practitioners. Addressing them, the Deputy Minister of Health, Kingsley Jedu, said the ministry is collaborating with the Medical and Dental Council to formulate policies to guide the profession. I've set up a quality management unit at the Ministry of Health with the sole objective of ensuring that Medical practitioners are doing their work professionally. They are observing all the rules and regulations, the code of conduct, and the professional ethics that they are required to observe. And that is one of the main ways that we are trying to ensure that there is quality of care at every facility. At the Medical and Dental Council, they are also coming up with code of conduct and then scope of work for each professional group. You know, there are a lot of professional groups in the health sector, whether they are dentists, they are uh, uh, general practitioners or specialists. They will ensure that if you are a specialist in dermatology, you cannot go and do dentistry. And in that way, we ensure that people stick to what they have. We are, we are not oblivious of what has been happening. You are in the media, so you know what has been happening in the media. People who haven't been trained for a particular professional uh, work, they go and do it, people lose their lives, and in this country it takes so long for people pro to be prosecuted. But be it at its may, even if the, the professional doctor or the doctor is prosecuted, the patient who has lost his or her life cannot come back to life. Administering the Hippocratic Oath, the board chair of the Ninth Council of the Medical and Dental Council, Professor Paul Kenyame, admonished them to learn to maintain patient-doctor confidentiality. 
In this era of social media, we have all become unwitting gossips and amateur pressmen, quickly transmitting what is new on WhatsApp to our friends. The patient must never be the subject for social WhatsApp traffic. Information about them must be treated in confidence even when they have died. Colleagues, and especially teachers, must be treated with respect. One upmanship, leading to the spreading of rumors and bad reports about colleagues for personal gain, is despicable and must not be practiced. For joining us, Philip Ankers report.